Okay, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, welcome to our program, History and Culture of the Lenape. Uh, Darius, Puff, uh, Darius Puff will be teaching us about the early lives of the Lenape who lived here in the Oli Valley and the changes their society went through in the 18th century through the use of artifacts, furs, and traditional storytelling. Mr. Puff has been speaking to community groups, historical societies, and on college campuses for over 20 years. So let's welcome him tonight. That works. Okay. Normally my mouth is big enough, but we got a deep room here, so we'll give it a whirl. I'm going to say, hey, Willie Kishko. In the old dialect, it means hello. It's been a good day. And for those of us who woke up vertical, it's a good day. You younger ones, you've got a lot to learn yet. My background is I've got Lenape descent. I've also got English blood. Those of you who have English blood, I apologize because I will pick on you. <laughs> I actually, there was some Dutch in my background, I found out. Holland Dutch. Pennsylvania Germans, you're on your own. I married one, so I know what I'm doing with that. <laughs> what I'm wearing is an 18th century regalia not a costume. Costume is something you make up at Halloween. Regalia is what we are. I've identified with the Lenape blood. I'm not saying I've rejected the rest, I just kind of managed to bury it. I had two different cultures. On my feet, elk moccasins. My leggings are deer skin, brain tanned, and I'll get into the brain tanning a little bit later. My shirt is linen, trade from the settlers. Got to remember, going back before the settlers get here, we didn't use cloth. We used skins, and on occasion there was something, I guess you could kind of call cloth, but I'm not sure I'd want to wear it beaten bark, woven, uh, generally elm, and it supposedly was, I'm going to say fairly, uh, I'm going to use the term comfortable just with quotes on it because I'm not sure. I wear silver jewelry, sterling silver. It's the only silver you're going to get in the 18th century. It's a trade item from the Europeans, both the French and the English. Uh, I don't know, I know we were friends with the Dutch to a point, but whether we really got silver off them or not, I'm not certain. I wear the silver because it's bright and shiny and I can. <laughs> the same reason you guys and basically you ladies, but there's a couple guys here that wear jewelry. Whether it's earrings, bracelets, necklaces, it doesn't matter. As long as it's bright and shiny and you can afford it, you got it. <coughs> the difference between the culture, so. My lady has to be as well dressed as I am, or I'm going to be considered a failure as a man. Mama comes first. And she comes first in almost everything, which is anti-European thought process, especially at that period of time. I have a bag. This one's out of blanket material. I have another one up here made out of deerskin with quill work for designs. Carries my junk. I don't have pockets. Every civilization has junk you want to carry around. I don't care what it is. This one carries the keys to my iron pony outside. <laughs> and for you ladies, you have my total sympathy because when I put my car keys in the top, they're gone. 
and you end up having to dump it sometimes to find them. I wear a knife around the neck. Now, I'm a modern native. This one is metal. A trade knife from Europe. This one happens to be a French design. This is nothing more than the kitchen knife, the utility knife in the European kitchens. Some of them were a little bit larger. Your whole thing is, is they were cheap and <laughs> easy to make. The Europeans made a buck out of it. They shipped them over, they got money, everything was working fine. They give them to the natives or trade them. We liked it because other than stone, it didn't break. It holds an edge. The knife is, yes, it can be a weapon, but it's the tool. No different. How many guys here have a pocket knife on them? Hello. All right. I know, in today's world, you can't carry the knife around because cops will go nuts. You ought to see me driving the turnpike in Regalia. <laughs> the guys at the toll booth, just you just watch the expressions on their face. We went out to, a buddy of mine and I went out to a funeral a few years back. And it was, you know, traditional to a point. We were painted. <laughs> That guy in the toll booth in Bedford was just priceless. <laughs> and whatever it was, the Stadies never caught us, so we were good. And I pick on cops because I'm a, I'm a retired one. Some of you know it, some, some I may have met you professionally, I don't remember. <laughs> and for those who do remember and want me to keep quiet, we'll talk later. Did 32 years in Boyer Town, and after 32, it was time to leave. Back on the regalia, uh, I'm also carrying a necklace. Now, somebody had asked me to uh, come up here to take a look at my stuff about uh, original stuff. Most of my articles up here are reproductions. They're decent reproductions, but because a lot of stuff gets handled, the real stuff doesn't come out. The beads I'm wearing on this necklace, these are the originals. They were a gift to me by an Abenaki friend who was a, I'm trying to think of the term, not a junk dealer, a scrounger. All right, let's put it that way. Apparently, one in the family, he told me that his dad was hired to go through the wreckage of a, it was a building that burned up in Maine. And the dad, the brother, my friend, went up, went through it, and down in the basement, it was like one of these hand dug old basements, Everything had fallen in, and in the corner were 18th century trade items, originals. So I got a handful of these beads, and he's passed on, so I wear them in his honor. The gorget, the medallion that's hanging here. For anybody who gets into reenacting and stuff, you'll see them both French design and English design. This is the French design, has the French coat of arms. For the simple reason, our people fought with the French in the Seven Years' War. Now, this was before, this actually occurred after the bulk of my relation, how close the relation, I can't tell you, <coughs> left the Oli Valley. They leave the valley. Well, there wasn't that many of them, but you got to put it, look at it through their eyes. You have La France raiding from Canada down across the Blue Ridge. And they're doing this on foot. 
The subways weren't running at that time. <laughs> and no matter what happens, the people down here, the native people, are going to look at it like, oh, geez, you all look alike, we're going to get blamed. So what's the easiest way? Pack up and get out before things really fall apart. I know you're, there's one book we had discussed, the uh, history of the Oli Valley, I think it is, and Dr. Pertoya, or uh, Bertolette, I guess it was, added the thing that we looked at one day and the Indians were gone. Okay, maybe by the time they got to look out the window, they were gone. But realistically, when a native village moves, it's not like you back Mayflower up and load the truck. The families go piecemeal, not always in the same direction, and they go at their own pace. Uh, for instance, not just with the Lenape, the Tuscaroras, who are part of the Six Nations up in New York now, originally down in uh, Carolina. And they got wolfed in a territorial fight with the whites. They moved up and they got permission from the, the five nations at that time of the Iroquois to come on up with us. It took over a generation and a half until they got up there. Now, I'll grant you, they didn't have the turnpike, but still, they end up in the Wilkes-Barre area and then gradually work their way up into New York. You know, good things take time. This is the same way when our people moved. Going back into history, we're immigrants. You guys don't have a lock on that. According to our own stories, we migrated from the West. And when I say the West, I'm talking way West. Think Asia. There's actually talk of going across a, the terminology was dark and angry water, way in the North. And that seems to be the terminology for any big water that they cross. I don't know, there's no imagination or whatever, but that's the terminology was used. They said our people crossed in a night. And you think, yeah, wait a minute, camping that many of them. Until you think, how long is a night in Alaska? Uh, just think about six months, which isn't too bad. We migrate down, and the way our stories are, you got to remember, all our historical stories are word of mouth, is oral tradition. They fought with people who used black magic in their warfare. Well, you go up into the Northwest Territory, well, Northwestern states, you have the Kingans, and one of their ways of making war was using black magic. Were these the same people? Good possibility. No guarantee in life. They come down and they start drifting east toward the rising sun. They get to one of the major rivers, a dark and angry river. Could have been the Mississippi. Could have been the Ohio. They wanted to cross. But there was people living on the other side. So they sent an emissary over, asked permission. Hey, can we cross? It looks nice on the other side there. No. Well, they dickered around a little bit. Okay, we'll trade you and we'll give you some goods. We'll cross and we'll just keep going east out of your area. And they agreed to it. Apparently, during the move across the river, these people 
who were already living there realized how many Lenape there were. Now, exact numbers we don't know. I've heard guesstimates of 10,000. Whether it's accurate or not, I really don't know. But whatever it was, it panicked the people. And they attacked. So now we got a warfare going on one side of the river, part of the Lenape on the back side of the river, and there's probably some poor fool got stuck in the middle. <laughs> this goes on for the reign or lifetime of seven sashim chiefs. Now, it sounds like a long time, but you remember, you could be appointed to be a sashim one day and dead the next. So there's no, you know, for sure how long everything is. Apparently the fighting kept everything to a standstill. Nothing was working. They wouldn't win, we weren't winning. Our people sent an emissary north. There was a parallel migration at the time. People we call Miwa. These are the ancestors of what you guys call the Iroquois. I can't tell you which of the tribes, but they were paralleling just north of our people. And I don't know where they started from. Apparently we had had some contact with them before all this fighting started. They reached an agreement with the Migwa to assist us for a share of the booty. Fighting starts again. Now you have two stories now, the Lenape side and the Iroquois side. We said we did the fighting and they just held back until it was at the time to swoop in and grab the booty. And they really haven't denied that from what I've understood. But whatever, the people were, the original people there were defeated and driven south. We described their villages as made out of dirt, which is kind of an unusual thing considering what most of the natives were using, skin lodges and bark. Were these the mound builders? I don't know. The Cherokee had a tradition of saying that they were driven <coughs> from the north to the south by some fighting. So this may be the early ancestors of the Cherokee we banged into. Uh, that would also explain why now the Lenape descendants, or Delaware as the English called us, are in Oklahoma on Cherokee land. And they are constantly in the courts fighting about it. So this may have started thousands of years ago and we didn't know it. Anyway, the Lenape uh, migration, we have people who were still on the far side of the river, the west side, and they looked at what went on in the east side and go, you know, I think we're going to stay put. It's not so nice over there. And they vanished out of our stories. With oral tradition, out of sight, out of mind. Those that went east, some stayed near the river, others continued eastward, until they basically bumped into the ocean. These are the people that the Europeans run against. How much time elapsed between them? Definitely hundreds of years, but how far exactly, we don't know. Their way of telling time is totally different than us. They go by the moon phase, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, your seasons, Life is good, we don't worry about it. They didn't bother punching a clock. Now when the Europeans get here, the Lenape are covering an area from east of the Susquehanna River, which would be, I'm going to guess somewhere in the Lancaster area because you have the Susquehannocks actually living along the river at the time. All the way out to the Atlantic Ocean, down to basically from the Potomac to the Hudson. All people of Lenape blood. Different breakdowns, different tribes. But your, ba your root base is Lenape. 
We have our three major areas. This area would have been covered pretty much by what we call the downriver people, the Unami. You go up into the Poconos, and north you have the Munsi, the hill people. These are your relation that really nice people, but you don't take out public a whole lot. You know, they're nice, but yeah. Then you have the ones that live in the shorelines. It's the smallest group, Onolachtigos. I call them Jerseyites. <laughs> they're close. They get driven out of Jersey by the Dutch, and I mean Holland Dutch. They get shoved across the Delaware River into, down, into the Unami area and are absorbed into that. So now you're basically down to two major groups for the original Lenape people. We have cousins, what we term cousins. The Nanakok, the Conway, the Shawnee. These are all peoples that we feel came east with our migration and broke off. You have, I think in any migration, you're going to have people saying, I'm not walking another step. You know, hey, did you see the chick over the ridge? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. But you lose people along the way. There's uh, some scholarly people who study languages. They break down North American Indian dialects into, I think, six or seven major groupings. The largest grouping is Algonquin, of which they say Lenape is part of that. Now, the one problem with that is Algonquin people refer to my people as grandfather, as the elder. So, eh, we're not so sure about how they, they put this apart. But you have Algonquin, which basically is from the Great Lakes down to the Potomac area on the eastern seaboard. You have a chunk out in the New York area, Iroquois. That's where Six Nations are. Go down into the southeastern people, your Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and all the other assorted ones. Uh, they have the Muskegon. They have their own grouping. Far west, you have, if you go, in fact, if you go north far enough, you have Inuit, your Eskimos. There's an Athabascan out in the west. Now, Anyway, they have found, and they're claiming, the root language of a couple of the prairie or western plains people is based in Algonquin stock. Northern Cheyenne, Blackfoot. Uh, I'm trying to think, there's about three or four others. <coughs> I think partly Crow. I don't know if both nations of the Crow were involved in this or not. These could be some of the people that we lost on the migration and just started their own civilization. I mean, you compare their religious beliefs versus ours, they're different. But you've got so much time interlapsed between them. A I would say a possibility. I won't say it's... You know, everything's knocked down in stone, but it's close. So anyway, we have our families. And I had mentioned that Mama comes first. When you have a young man, once you get married, and they're yeah, 15, 16, you know, it's not a, similar to the settlers at the time. Maybe a little bit older, because they were trained as warriors first. Then they worried about starting their families. 
he has to go check check out the chicks. All right, sounds good. We got one problem. We have bloodlines. We call them clans, and it's not the ones with the pointy hats. This is the bloodline. We're down to three right now: wolf, turtle, and turkey. I happen to be wolf clan. The major rule is you will not marry into your own clan. There is no exceptions. And I guess the reasoning for this is that one state that butts up to the southeast, southwest corner of Pennsylvania, the hillbillies. Now for those of you from West Virginia, I apologize. <laughs> But it's so strict where you have a guy wants to marry so maybe he can taste it. But the girls in his village know him. Ah, it doesn't work well. So he starts working in different villages, checking for chicks. Well, Moccasin Telegraph moves pretty quick. All the girls seem to know what he's up to. Finally, works his way all the way up through the Muncie area, up into the hills. Going up into what is now New York. And he trips over a beautiful Mohawk woman. Not one happy. Mohawk. Yeah, I mean, there is no such thing as a beautiful Mohawk woman, but this is just for <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> Everybody's fair game for me. They fall in love. The clan mothers say, whoa, wait a minute. She's the same clan, even though it's a different tribe. Marriage will not go forward. Because by clan rules, you are family, no matter what the tribe is. The clan, according to traditions, supersedes the breakdown of the tribes. So it's, uh, then it gets more tricky. You think that was bad. He finally gets a girl. They have children. The children will follow the clam line of the mother, not the father. And as one old grandmother told me one time, I asked her, I said, okay, I know this is why it, this happens. I'm not arguing that. Where'd you come from? How far back do we go? And she just looked at me, a little old lady smiling sweetly. She says, we know who your mother is. Oh, <laughs> we just, <laughs> just let it go with that. <laughs> we had marriage, just, you know, the bride presence. Uh, in fact, in some cases, the courting would be, they would have a, a flute. And if you've ever heard native flute music, it's really pretty. I have a flute. I can only play it enough to keep the mice out of the house, so I don't bring it out. He'll court her, make up a song, sit back and far enough away from her father. And she finds a way to get out to him. Where there's a will, there's a way. And if she doesn't, he makes up another song or finds another girl. It's just the way it is. They have a marriage bread, basically baked by the mother of the girl, delivered to the mother of the boy. Everybody's in agreement. Life is good. They build a lodge and, in theory, live happily ever after. Now, the one thing with our rules. The lady will own the lodge from the time it's built and everything in it, with three exceptions. Her husband's weapons, clothing, and medicine. All children belong to the mother. They will follow her clan. <coughs> we had divorce. Nobody's perfect. Mom figures dad transgressed, or for whatever reason, 
She puts his belongings outside the lodge. That's it. That's the end of it. No lawyers, no courts, none of this stuff. And they call us savages? <laughs> He'd go home to Mama. Because he would go to her village initially. This would add a warrior and a hunter to that village. Uh, you had death. Back then, you had a lot of it. Lifespans were not that long. I had one question a while back of burial customs. Historically, uh, we, bur we buried in the ground. We did not put them on poles or scaffolds or anything like that. We didn't use the rock carns that everybody thinks we did. And for those, if anybody here is from up in the Hereford area, uh, apparently there's some rock piles up there, and I keep being told that, well, they're the native burial ground. Not ours. I don't know who they are, but they're not ours. Uh, you're buried in what finery you have, assuming there's time. The men and the women are buried the same way, head to the east. You have initially like slabs of bark placed over the body to keep the dirt off it. There is a grave marker one piece of wood carved with clan symbol and stuff, one for a woman, one for a man, slightly different. It's in place there one time. When the element's taken and it's gone, it's not replaced. It's sort of like those who have seen The Lion King, the circle of life, it just goes on. You're painted. For the ladies, your part of your hair is used for vermilion, round ruche uh, circles on the cheeks. <coughs> for the guys, basically three vermilion lines from the eyes back to the ears. Where this started from, I don't know. I mean, it goes back forever. <coughs> Once the settlers get here, you start hearing of burials with coffins. Instead of the circular burials in the ground, now they're in a box. The box will have holes in it to let the spirits out. Even today. Trust me, I know where I'm speaking on this one. So, uh, what did we believe? One supreme being. Period. We didn't worship rocks, we didn't worship trees. I don't care what Hollywood said. It's just not, it's not what it is. We acknowledge that every living being has a spirit, which does drive some people up a wall. Everything cre was created by one, one being using other spirits under the control. I get into the creation story, but unless everybody brought a lunch, we're, it's going to take too long. It's like the technical, the migration story I gave you basically is the Reader's Digest version. The original one probably would be better part of four or five hours and to do it exactly. Now, if you have questions, flip your paws up and I'll try to answer them while I'm gone. Because I've got like 10,000 years of history and I don't know if I can compress it all in one hour. Anybody? Okay, I'm just going to take a break. What I have up here are trade items from the 18th century. Skins. You have everything from deer skin, bear, 
Uh, raccoon, skunk, gray fox, muskrat, otter, beaver. This bad boy. This guy's called a fisher. He's a solitary tree dweller. <laughs> Generally lives up in the Poconos, but I understand my son-in-law keeps swearing there's one down in Sassmanville, so I have no clue. Uh, they do not come with arrows, that's in addition. <laughs> they needed a quiver, so. These guys will eat porcupines. These are not warm and cuddly critters. When you are up, anybody camp up in the Poconos? If you see one floating around, don't take it home to make a pet out of it. It's very hard on the family cat. <laughs> and your baby brother, too, for that matter. We use every bit of the critter you can. You don't waste. Um, something we were taught from little. Now, uh, okay, we call it ecology. We gave it a name. For us, it was common sense. You have, basically, we'll just go with deer. Full-size brain tan deer skin. This is what we use for clothing. For instance, my leggings, like I said. Come on up afterwards, it's soft. It'll take you five or six days to make a hide. When I say brain tan, I mean it. You're using the brain and the animal to tan the hide. The tanning process is done by the women and the younger kids and some of the elders that are living with them. You take a shirt for a guy my size, four hides. My leggings are one hide each, so right there are six deer. Now, granted, it's your major meat, and there was a lot more deer around. You used every bit. Uh, somewhere in here, where did I put? Some days I forget where I put stuff. Okay, yeah. You got the hide, you got the meat. Everybody who sews. The boys are taught to sew, same as the girls. I had nothing to do with that one. Anyway, this is sinew. This is the tendon that runs up the back legs and down the spine. Dry it out, and when you want to have thread, you soak it in water, or the old ladies used to chew it, and you split it apart. When sinew is wet, it stretches. I mean, it's not like a rubber band, but you get a little elasticity in it. If you go to a museum and you see leather work, that is on display. Generally it is sewn with sinew, not necessarily deer sinew, it could be buffalo, elk. A lot of your exhibits there are 150 plus years old and they're still viable. How much of our clothing that we're wearing today is going to be viable in 100 years? <laughs> Very little, I think. Something else you can use Save the bones. Shoulder blade. If you notice, it's just slightly curved. It fits the hand. When you have your skin up on a stretcher, you can scrape the fat and the bad stuff off. If you wear it out, don't worry. Deer come with two. Creator was good. He knows it. For you ladies who also do the gardening, put a handle on it and you got a hoe. South end of a deer, the tail. Now what are we going to do with this? Fly swatter, cut some off and tie it onto a, sti a stick and you have a paintbrush. Or dye it with vermilion. And you can use it for pretty. Just like 
I have some on my mocks, and on the bag here, that red hair is the hair of the deer that made this bag. Now, that's spraying tan deer skin, but it's darker than the other. This was dyed in black walnuts to give it the color. The other decoration on there are porcupine quills. That's an art that's really kind of disappearing. And truthfully, getting the, the quills off the porcupine is a trick in itself. <laughs> I have, let's see, other quill work. There's my knife sheath up here that I'm wearing is quilled, as well as uh, something in a, in a case. It takes a lot, of, a lot of work to do it, and it's beautiful. But once we got beads, wow! You didn't have to chase the porcupine. <laughs> and you already had pre-colored. The trade beads were pre-colored. And you didn't have the pointy ends. You know, life is good. And I had a question back there. Lily? Yeah. I was wondering, how long have you been aware of your Indian heritage? Because I know you have a From, from birth. A lot, of, a lot of my heritage was passed down. Uh, my dad technically told me, he says, look, I'm walking the white road to survive. He grew up through the Depression and all that. And back into that time, going through World War II, it wasn't cool to be red. Or even part of it. My maternal grandmother she was a trip she really liked the native blood real proud of it her sister denied it and it was like yeah I'm a kid I get these two old ladies fighting over this thing and I find out later now one thing I think happens with it could be the rest of the background but I think it's native blood we're pack rats we save everything My mother saved every written scrap of communication that I think was formed from the time she was born. After she passed, my dad crossed. I have everything in the house. <laughs> and the wife's parents crossed, and we got all their stuff, too. I'm going through old cards. I'm talking birthday cards from the Second World War. <laughs> you know, I'm going through this. Okay. I'm working on the genealogy, but let's just see what's going on here. I'm not saying anything. I promised her I'd go through the stuff. I didn't say I was throwing it out, but I said I'd go through it. I hit an anniversary card, 1944, addressed to the chief and his squaw. Now, Dad was in the South Pacific at that point. The sign, love. Aunt Hattie, my mother's, or my grandmother's sister. So she knew. The thing was, I found out later, she was a buyer for one of makers down in Center City. Down there, if you weren't a wasp, you weren't getting a job. And she was, like I said, she was a buyer, and they actually sent her to Europe. You know, this was, and for a woman, she did good. So she wasn't going to rock the boat. So, to answer your question, yes, I've known it for quite a while. Pinning it down because it's family stories is a little harder. For instance, Grandma says we intermarried twice with the whites. My dad didn't know about that. Now, Grandma was Grandma, so I'm you know, I got to take that with a grain of salt. But I have found a sixth grade grandmother I cannot put a last name to. And even through her wills, her husband's will, her marriage certificate, there's no last name. 
which could indicate native. And I'm only saying could, because we don't know. I'd like to think so, but I still don't know. Yes, sir? Yeah, so I got a question for you. Uh, I don't know, are you familiar at all with the book Ops and Ops? Say, say that again. Are you at all familiar with the book called Atsunatsu? It's the history of the West Branch of the Susquehanna River. Not by that title, no. Well, in, this, in that book, they, uh, they're talking about Indians, Native Americans, and they have English names. An, mm -hmm. Indi an Indian named John Smith. Yeah. And the explanation... The book does not explain that, it just, you know, states it. The explanation that I got was that the Moravian ministers moved northwest up that way. That was when that was just being uh, ex explored by the white men. Right. And that they tried to convert the Indians slash Native Americans to Christianity, and they gave them English names. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. We call them black robes. There's another group of black robes coming down from Canada, the Jesuits, doing your same thing, conversion. The, the way they did it was different. The Jesuits prepared to convert the whole village at one time. Same time. The Moravians would take you one family at a time. Now, the one difference with the Moravians um, there's a book out by John Hickweiler, who was a Moravian missionary, lived among our peoples. Uh, my understanding is he actually did marry two Delaware women. I lived them both. Very knowledgeable, very observant similar to, uh, as far as writing everything down, something like you would see with the Mormons, you know, very profound on the writings. Everything is pretty decent with him until you get into the spiritual end, and then he be, it's really narrow-minded. But he was a missionary, so you can't expect much different there. But the, your generalization, how the village lived, and everything, beautifully done. Your one problem is Heckweiler, at that period of time, wrote in High German. He also did a hymnal in Delaware. Now, you're taking a phonetic language, as ours, translating that into High German. Now they want to reprint it in English. <laughs> Life gets interesting, to put it mildly. A friend of mine uh, is with the Moravian uh, Museum, and she had told me she, she knew my wife uh, would read German. She said, does she read high German? And you not only have to read high German, you got to go past the penmanship. You've seen any of those old clips? colonial ways of writing. It's beautiful writing. If you, I don't know that you can read it, but it really looks neat with all the scrolls and everything. It's really neat. But to try to translate that around, that's where you have a problem. Uh, as far as the conversions, yeah. You have back uh, during the F and I period, right outside of Lee Heighton, there was a Moravian convert village, and I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation. Gadotenhuten? And ring any bells? Okay. Our people had a. The deal was outside natives who were not converts were not welcome in the village. That was the one way the Moravians would stop backsliding. You could decorate the inside of your cabin. Lenape. But the outside was typical little white cabins. There was uh, 
somewhere, I think around 1758, seven or eight, there was a raiding party come out of um, Sunbury, I believe, Delaware land. They went down to Gannat and Hooten and flattened it. Not a native was hurt. 18 Moravians went home, but uh, mm. you know, you can't have everything. Then they, they spread their missionary out into the Ohio River Valley, and you have a second village by the same name out there, which also got destroyed later on. Go ahead. So, so it would be highly possible then that a lot of people with English, English names could have Native American blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unless they would investigate and search back, they would never know. Yeah, and you, one thing you find too with marriages, uh, you, well, this is the period of the time. It was not approved, but they didn't say much when a white man took a native woman. If he was going to marry her, she had to be a convert. And even some of the preachers would not marry a non-white convert or not. Everything was kind of individually done per preacher or church. Uh, and then you had the other side of the thing, a white woman taken up with a native man. Woo, boy, did that blow the barn door off. <laughs> so a lot of times, if you had an actual marriage, trying to find the paperwork for that is rough. Most of your converts will have generally single names and generally a Christianized name, biblical, at some point. Uh, like I said, we normally didn't go with two names. We had our clan. That was your bloodline. So it's, you know, it kind of, it varies, but there's nothing perfect in, in that, that regard. But the conversions, oh yeah. Just, just for your information, in this book, there are a few references, references, two or three, where the white settlers that moved up there, a, a few white women went to live with the Native Americans. They liked it better, and they lived with Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Actually, you have that. You'll find that with during the wars. Prisoners. Uh, the big thing in the early native warfare, this is native against native and native against settler. <coughs> the biggest thing there was taking prisoners. Your prisoners could be ransomed back to their families. They could be sold to the opposite side. Like, if our people fought with the French, we would take settlers prisoner, run them up to Montreal or Quebec, where they would buy the whole prisoner. Not like buying a hog, you know, same like idea. Killing outside, especially outside the heat of battle, was one of the last things in the early warfare stages. We did change. We did adapt European customs. But initially, Creator gives life to all, even our enemies. So to take a life, even a Cherokee, was, you know, you were kind of knocking Creator. So you had to do a little bit of penance for that. So that would be your last resort. Now, some of the things, okay, before I get asked, I have no clue where that one came from. Um, the French did not teach us to scalp. I've heard that rumor floating around for so many years. We managed to learn all by ourselves. We really didn't need instructions. Early trophies for especially just native warfare 
Our people would run down the warrior path all the way down into the Carolinas. Fight the Cherokee, fight the Choctaw, and to prove that you you were manhood, forget the John Wayne thought process, you take trophies to bring them home. Whole heads. Okay, now, think about this. Native warfare is generally done in good weather. We're not going to fight in the winter. We're not stupid. <laughs> Unfortunately, carrying a couple of heads from Georgia up to Pennsylvania in August, you start walking alone. Nobody wants to walk near you. Eventually, they kind of figured out, you know, instead of the whole head, why not just take the hair? It packs easier. I mean, some of it is a little more practical than Hollywood would have you believe, but it is what it is. Oh, why well, on Hollywood? Let's go pick on that. Movies. Okay. Uh, I have up here a pipe. It's a tomahawk, but it's a smoking pipe. It's kind of two for one. You can smoke with a friend in French events. You know, I have one of those things. The one problem with these are you cannot throw them. They're not balanced. There are tomahawks that are made for throwing, but the pipe hawk is not. It's a hollow stem. Mel Gibson, the Patriot. He has a, br a brass one which they did make presentation brass ones. He's throwing this at British soldiers. Now, I got no problem with him throwing at British soldiers, but it won't fly, literally. But it looked good on film, so it's in the movie. Also, Last of the Mohicans. Okay, the last one. There was one made, a black and white made in 30, Five or thirty-seven. The one with uh, yeah Daniel Day Lewis. Okay, you have the the real baddie, supposedly if you read the book, Magua. West Studi. He portrays a hero. He's Cherokee by birth. Chingachgook. The grandfather, Mohican warrior, and he has the biggest war club you have ever seen in your life. And how he keeps running with that bloody thing is beyond me. He's Lakota. Dennis Banks, who was the head Huron chief. He's Ottawa, I think, but he's not Huron. A friend of mine was an extra in the movie. That's where I get some of my trivia. <laughs> if you go get the CD or the DVDs, actually, I have the VHS. <laughs> you stop the film anywhere you want, you will not see a close up of the moccasins. They're painted boat sneakers. <laughs> The cost of making deerskin moccasins for a couple hundred extras, it was cheaper to buy the boat sneakers and airbrush them. And that's why if I'm going back over that movie, Chris told me about this, and I'm going back over it, and he's right. There's no close-up of the moccasins. There's everything else on everybody else, but not the feet. That's like, and if you do see the feet, they're in a distance. You can't tell what they're wearing. Historically, let's put it this way, it followed the book. The book necessarily did not follow history. Books written somewhere 80 years after the fight, which did occur. Uh, you don't have a lot of first person interviews involved. Colonel Monroe, if he had children, and I think that's up in the air as well, did not have them in, on this continent. 
Colonel Monroe did not die under Magua's knife. He drops dead in Albany of a stroke two months after the siege. He is buried in Albany. But dying under Magua's knife looks better on, TV, on the screen than you know, gasping and dropping. So it's, I just love picking on Hollywood because it's so much fun. Um, there was something, oh yeah. Headgear, I'm not wearing anything tonight. And as the wife has told me, I'm thinning out. And apparently it happens to all of us. I'm looking out there and there's some of us more than others. <laughs> this is one piece called a gustoa or gustoa. It's basically a feathered cap. The frame is made out of ash. Uh, the front piece are wampum beads, and it's layered with bird of prey feathers. It's more ceremonial. I've danced in powwows wearing this, and there is no airspace in there. <laughs> it gets hot, especially in July. So, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little wiser. It sits. A British waistcoat or military vest. This is Colonel Monroe's actual home regiment. The third, uh, 26th of foot infantry regiment. Monroe was a real person, like I said. This was his home regiment. The reason I've got it, and I'm wearing the French coat of arms, our people fought at that fight with Mont Montcalm against Colonel Monroe. The Lenape were one of the 40 different native tribes the French had. So it's one of those, I wear it in the powwow circle to tweak the English nose. Oh, yeah, talking about tomahawks. How you like this one? One piece of wood, called a ball club. Every warrior carves their own, their own way. Mine is a serpent holding the face. This is carved out of rock maple. This is good for walnuts, skulls, kneecaps. These were used actually all the way up through the American Revolution. So we're not talking a Stone Age weapon that fell apart. They've been around for quite a while. Remember I said about prisoners being the most important product of the warfare? What's a prisoner's first job? Run. Get out of there. One shot in each knee, they don't run. They walk funny, but that's their problem. That's not ours. We call them. The, ooh, ooh. If you have other questions, please ask. Yes, sir. How about the care of the elders? Elderly were honored. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. We can't hear the question. Okay, what about care of the elderly? Um, the elders were honored. You didn't have Mount Ides like we have today. But your families were closer. The family took care of the old. Your elders were teachers. They're the ones who kept the traditions going. They passed everything down. Um, when they got too infirmed to be able to hunt, provide for themselves, other people would provide the food for them. Just say you have a grandfather, grandmother, a widowed daughter, and kids, and the kids are too small to hunt big game. Granddad's busted up. Somebody within the 
either the family clan or the sashim or chief himself would be providing food until the widow marries again and gets a provider. Um, you can be, you see, with age comes wisdom, supposedly. There are sometimes I'm not so sure about that, but, eh, you know. Uh, but this is one of the things where everything was passed down through the elders. Your kids are taught by their uncles. Now, uncles not in the bloodline sense that we consider an uncle. I would be an uncle to any young person in there. It was just a form of address. It's sort of like grandfather. It's a mark of respect. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually blood kin. Um, that give you kind of an idea. Okay. Anybody else? Where? Oh, okay. I'm looking at the wrong spot. What, what can you tell us about the sacred oak? Okay. Sacred oak. This will probably be heresy for some. I am not a firm believer in the Oaks stories. I've heard about them. Everything I've heard come through white sources. I've checked through native sources, my own people. I've talked to some elders from Oklahoma where our people ended up. Their first question was, where's Oldie? <laughs> And it gives you an idea that, okay, if there was a legend, it wasn't passed down. Uh, there's apparently some couple different thoughts on the age of the tree. I've been out there. It's an interesting tree. I can't say that I'm not. I was originally trained Penn State as a forester, so I do, I can appreciate that. Does it have the magical properties that some of these legends are talking about? I'm not so sure. I'll never say never, because I've been wrong before. The question of age, your settlers don't get into this area until what, seven, early 1700s, correct? So we're only talking 300 years ago. How fast does an oak grow? Where do these stories actually start from? I've never actually heard that other than the Indians said, well, you know, that's sort of like my grand, my granddaughter saying, well, grandma said it was okay. You know, yeah, I'm not so sure. Beyond that, I really can't tell you much about it. Um, I know there are some people who are fervently believe, and there are some other people who fervently do not believe. And that's within the native circles. And it's like, uh, I've had a couple Cherokees. Well, we're going to get healed up at the oak. Okay, have a, you know, you have a blast. I think a lot of it is what do you believe? It exists, but do all the things that are attributed to it exist? I can't tell you that. I don't know. And... I think because of the police background, I'm a little more of a skeptic than some other people. Um, I'm not asking for proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but I want a little bit more than he said, she said type of thing. And I, I really have not seen it. Um, Beyond that, I can't give you any more of an answer. I don't know what else to say on that. Yes, ma'am. As far as how far back, we're not sure yet. Question. Okay, the question is, do I have a Lenape name and how far back do I go? I honestly, as far as 
How far does this native come in? We're not sure. Uh, if this one grandmother shows up, for sure, we're looking at roughly 1710. But I don't think she's the earliest. I think there's a later one. Because I got a couple branches on the family tree which just kind of end up in the clouds and we're not sure where they're going. I know what some of our traditions say, but they're a little sparse on detail. Native name for me is Silver Wolf. Uh, I just happened to be Wolf Clan. I was just, <laughs> I was just in. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. Do you have any recommended publications or books on the history of the Lenape? Okay, it depends how fast you want to go to sleep. <laughs> There's uh, most of the books written now were written in the early 20th century. Um, C. Moment, C. S. or C. W. Wanschlager, History of the Delaware. It's a thick one, so it's, it, keep it by your bedside. You know, it saves warm milk. You know, <laughs> he does it in a very scientific, scholarly manner, and really slow. <laughs> There are some others. You can have everything from uh, John Heckweiler's. Um, in, I'm not sure what it's, whether it's Indians in Pennsylvania or not. But just look under uh, John Heckweiler's writings. They're not too bad. Uh, there's a history of the Western Delaware. It's published out of Oklahoma, and I'm trying to, I don't remember who the author is. I haven't seen it around for a while, so it's more than likely it's out of, out of print. Libraries might have it. I don't know about it in this area, but uh, let's see. Actually, if you get to, with the historic, it won't get into some of the culture, but it will give you some of the historical ends. Uh, the writings of Colonel Henry Bouquet, English Army. This will take care of the end of the F and I going into the quote Pontiac uprising. He's the guy who read, uh, saved Port, uh, Fort Pitt when it was besieged. And again, he wrote a lot. Uh, yeah, you have to go through it, but. That's about all I can t tell you right off the top of my head. I see a hand flying down at the end there somewhere. With, DN with DNA so popular today, are they able to trace back all the different tribes? Okay, it's a question about DNA, how good is it, <laughs> pretty much. I get mixed emotions on DNA. Number one, with Native American, they're not going to tell you tribe. I don't know if they can t pin it down to where, I mean, how far back it pops into your bloodline. And I'm starting, I've heard some stuff with some of the labs with, there's so many different DNA stuff out now. Uh, I've heard some questions about the competency of a couple of the labs. And I'm wondering sometimes if they're just pushing this through a little bit too fast. Um, I'm not sure. I know when I was working on with the police force, they have DNA was just starting. And back then, if you wanted to try to get a DNA match, you were lucky if you got it within six to eight months. Now, it's like like on TV, boom, before the commercial is over, we get it. And I'm not so sure it's the best way, but it is what it is. I've never seen it... Uh, I know my, my one cousin took it, and uh, now it's on my maternal side. I, I'm going to have to ask her 
whether it tells where or when the different bloodlines come together. And more, and more or less, it seems to just tell them, okay, you have this percentage, this percentage, this percentage, but they're not getting into, you know, 200 years ago or whatever. Well, you're welcome to come up, take a look. You got other questions? Well, how is the uh, Lenny Lenapis come up? I never heard you mention them. No, I haven't. You, you lost me on that. The, Go ahead. The Lenapis. What about us? You never mentioned any of them. Okay, I got lost on this one. Well, the Lenny hmm? Lenapi. Oh, pronunciation. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Around here, I have always heard him say Lenapi. That's what the way we say Lenapi. It's the English way of saying it. It's the Lenny. The Lenny. The Lenny. Lenny or Lenai, depending on modern day Unami dialect. Leno means man. If you go through the like, you would be. Um, with Latin, Lenai, plural, might mean men. But we're, Lenape is the original people, original man, depending on whose translation you're looking at. Man of the original men, I don't know. I, I Sometimes I think it got fouled up somewhere way back in history. How, how does the, the name Manatoni translate from the... From the Manatoni. Yeah, Manatoni. I've heard it translated, I can't tell you what it is, and I can't tell you that it's Lenape. A lot of the native names, or the stuff that is attributed to native yeah. dialect, especially on rivers, streams, moving water for our people contains the term Siku. Manitoni doesn't do that. Manatoni was being interpreted by some of the, as it was passed down in words, by some of the tribes that were moving along into the Carolinas. And they would come down to Manatoni, and they, it was said that this is where we drank the liquor. Could be. I can't tell you for true. I don't know. That's a local interpretation. It's sort of like some of the other other names for different places attributed to a native dialect. Who did they have translated? We don't know. You go down into the Philadelphia area. Uh, even going up into the northeast, Shemokin. Okay, what is it? I don't know. I mean, native dialects may very well be. But we also have, uh, I've had people tell me Schuylkill is native. It's Dutch. Anything with a kill on the end is Dutch. Holland Dutch. So, you know, exactly which is which. I'm not a linguist. We, we call it what it is for what we can. Yeah, I think we're going to cut the questions off. If you have questions for the speaker, please come up to the table. Uh, I don't want this to go much longer as a group, but please feel free to go up to the table and, and talk.